So welcome back, everyone. And uh, bang on time, we're about to uh, restart. So if you're just coming in, do, uh, do take a seat. And usual request, not that we're crowded right now, but I suspect we're going to have some more people returning from coffee in a moment. So do leave some room at the end of the row. That'd be really good. So uh, this morning and yesterday, we covered a lot of ground around the, um, uh, the duopoly in advertising and what that means for media owners. We looked at how media owners are reorganizing themselves, bringing in new skills that may not have been needed before that often come from outside the industry um, to tackle new challenges, but also to embrace new opportunities. And there is some debate about whether artificial intelligence is an opportunity or is it a challenge? And what does it mean for all of us? And for many of us, it's tempting to say, well, that's just a thing that, to be honest, that happens in a different world. It's not really going to affect my media company if I'm medium-sized or small. Not a thing I necessarily need to worry about. But I suspect the panel we're about to run may change uh, some of our minds in terms of how it's changing the way uh, we live as people, what's coming down the line on that, and also how we consume media, and more importantly for all of us here, how we uh, create media. So you're familiar with the pattern by now. I'm going to invite our panelists up to, stay, up to the stage. And all you need to do uh, for the entire afternoon is give a rapturous round of applause to uh, each one. Uh, so uh, please welcome uh, the Strategy and Development Manager for Associated Press, Francesco Marconi. Francesco. <laughs> there. And the chief, just right there, please. It'd be great. Perfect. And then um, the Chief Executive of World News Media Network, Martha Stone. Oh, you're there, Martha. Hello. <laughs> and if you could go in the middle there. And finally, uh, Global Product Partnerships at Google, Alice Zimmerman. And while Martha's being uh, mic'd up, uh, we'll set the ground rules. We've got um, about half an hour to cover this topic, which is a colossal topic. So we're going to have a few um, starter for 10 questions. But as always, the point is that if you have questions of your own, don't be afraid to ask them and we will uh, we'll make sure they, they get answered. Um, so store them up, and if we have time at the end, if we haven't argued amongst ourselves for so long that there's literally not a second left, uh, we'll absolutely come to the floor. Um, okay, I guess the opening question for all of you, and we'll do it in order, and I'm afraid sitting on the end means you get come to first one way or the other. Um, the opening question, I suppose, is really, how is artificial, artificial intelligence affecting media right now? Is it actually being used? Is it having an impact today? And, um, and where is it going? So a fairly big question. But uh, for those of us who are saying, well, perhaps it's not something that's directly affecting me, um, maybe, maybe it is. Um, Francesco, do you want to kick off? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my perspective on, on AI uh, is centered around uh, the, the impact on content creation. Uh, as most of you might be familiar with, with the Associated Press, we are a supplier of content. Um, and so what we noticed recently is that uh, we live in an oversupplied market. Um, and the way to, uh, to com combat that oversupplied market is through volume of content uh, as well as differentiation. And that's exactly how we are, how we are using um, uh, artificial intelligence to tackle those two opportunities. Um, so what, what we are, um, the way that we are looking at the AI, and, and I have a, a few slides if, if we want to. Yeah, if we can bring Francesco's slides up. Bring if you, them up. You click your next, that should um, There we go. All right, so next slide. Oh, those, is, those are yours. Yeah. Can anyway. we get Francesco's up? Is that possible? So, um, so just the way that we are looking at it is we are looking at AI for automation, so full automation, and that addresses the, the volume issue uh, as well as uh, augmentation. So how can we use AI to uh, enable uh, the human creativity uh, that, um, that occurs in, in the newsroom? And I really wanted to show you some, some visual examples because it's easier to... So give um, me a signal from the desk when we're ready with these slides, yep. please. That'd be great. All right, no yep. problem. Uh, so uh, in terms of automation, we are, uh, we are doing a lot of different projects 
in terms of turning uh, data into text, for example, as well as text uh, into video. And the role there is not to uh, displace journalists or content creators from their jobs. Uh, it's instead to free uh, resources up so they can focus on more high-level um, uh, creative, uh, creative work. And the volume thing is important simply from a traffic perspective. Is that because you're able to monetize the additional traffic you can generate through using AI to create content? Is, uh, that, is that why it's important? So for AP is a very specific case because we are supplying content mm. to the market. So it's not that we monetize directly uh, through, through advertisements. Uh, but what we found is that we can open new markets. We can better serve uh, our, uh, uh, our clients, which are publishers, uh, like many of you in the room, uh, with uh, new forms of, of content that were previously very difficult to, uh, to create at scale. Just to give you an example, uh, a very successful project um, is centered around the automation of um, earnings reports, so financial news. Uh, and we went from being able to cover 300 stories or 300 companies to over 4,000 uh, companies. And that's about a 12x uh, increase. Uh, on, the, on, on content output. Uh, at the same time, we were able to uh, free up 20% of, of journalists' time uh, that were working on, on, on business reporting previously to that. Um, so it's both uh, enabling more scale of content, but at the same time, uh, giving content creators more time so they can focus on um, higher uh, and high, higher impact uh, journalism. And I want to return in a, in a minute or two yep. to the question of, uh, of, of quality and the perceived quality from your clients and the recipients of your, your news feeds as to whether they're uh, accepting of the idea or whether there's a, there's a threshold below which they, they're, they're, or above which they're, uh, they're not prepared to, uh, to go. Can I just check on whether Francesco's slides are available? No? Okay. Uh, we've lost them, I'm afraid, but no we'll problem. come back to them yeah, I'll if show we them possibly later. can. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, Martha, if we can turn to you uh, for a moment. Um, Where's AI from your perspective? Uh, is it something we should be either concerned about, that we should celebrate, and what impact is it having right now on news media? Yeah, um, so just to give a little background, um, I have run a big data and AI conference for five years. They, uh, the, the conference started here, the international conference started here in London, and now we're on to our sixth annual conference uh, in Hong Kong this December. And what we focus on, of course, is leveraging that big data that we all have. We all collect data about usage of our users, but the question is, what do you do with all of that data? So now you can leverage AI technology to target um, those customers. Uh, you can create new products on the fly. You can, you can do all kinds of things with AI. So what we do in this conference called Big Data and AI for Media is we, um, we look at the business side. How do we create new products and how do we make money from all of this big data and AI? So um, the answer is, where are we in this industry? Well, we're taking baby steps, but there are a lot of media companies that are taking bold steps. And of course, Google is, is one of them, but from the traditional media standpoint, I do a survey every year. I've done it since 2014 to show where um, media companies around the world are right now in their strategies. And really, they're at the beginning stages. What is the begin be beginning stage that is going to be a good foundation for you using AI? And that is to be create a data lake. This takes a great deal of resource, both money and time. So I'm going to, to back create. you up slightly there, that term, yes. a data lake? A data lake is where all of your data that you've been collecting you know, and you don't know what to do with, that all that data then is to put, be put into one technical receptacle where it can be accessed from one place. This is extremely important, and this is the foundation of your, of your strategy. You must do this. Um, it took The Guardian, as an example, here in London, it took The Guardian about a year to put all of their disparate data sets or data uh, stockpiles into one because they had to clean the data, make it all talk to each other so that then it could be accessed and then output into new products, into uh, targeting advertising, for example, targeting even for content, um, what Francesco was talking um, about. Just for 
clarity, what kind of data are we talking about? Is this data about uh, readers, consumers? Is it news content? Is it other data? What, what sort of data in the Guardian yeah. case, for example? Yeah, um, it's, it's usage data about what, what people are using, when they are using it, how long they're dwelling on that particular content. Um, and then it's also about creating profiles of users to find out what we as individuals like so that that media company then can create a profile on you so that they can serve up information. Let me give you an example here in, here in London, once again, and BBC um, has created, um, on behalf of all of their uh, paid users, the, the citizens of the UK, um, they have created something called My BBC. And what that is, is a whole receptacle of information about us as individuals, both implicitly and explicitly collected. In other words, I tell them what I'm interested in, on one hand, and on the other hand, I am tracked throughout the BBC websites to see what I'm actually consuming, how long, um, you know, what, and then they serve me suggestions, recommendations on what might be of interest to me to make my experience more delightful and also um, more relevant to me. Um, those are just some examples, but also that information is going to be used to create products on different platforms that's most relevant to you as an individual rather than to you as an entire group of people from the magazine media who used to be you know, a good target group, but now the target group is me in, as an individual. And that's one of the beauties of, of AI is to be able to give me what I want, when I want it, on the platform I want it on, and for the length of time I want. And, so, and I, yeah, please, I would yeah. add one thing, which is, I mean, definitely the, the data uh, question is the most crucial question to, to be answered. Then beyond uh, recommendation, which was uh, what Martha was just uh, alluding to, I think there's another opportunity, which is the personalization of, of the content. So if we are able to track how consumers, uh, you know, speak online, how they communicate with each other, then we can uh, personalize the content to fit you know, their tone. Is it formal? Is it informal? Uh, localize it and in, in, in therefore generate a lot of uh, engagement around that uh, affinity uh, type of, of, of information. So depending on what it knows, I might get, uh, hey, Mike, here's what's happening, or I might get, dear Mr. Hewitt, here is your news briefing. Exactly. Because it and senses what level of interaction I like. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, I think we're being signaled by the AI over in the corner that your slides may be ready. Right. But what I'm going to suggest is we come we'll, back to we'll that. Come back. Uh, because Alice is sitting on the end very patiently. And it must be one of these things about representing Google that you know they're going to get to you in the end and they're going to ask you the big serious questions, particularly at, uh, at media events. But just give us your perspective on um, uh, AI. Where is it in a media perspective? And what sort of impact is it already happening that we may not even know about yet? Sure. Um, may I have oh, yeah, a sure. So AI is a field of research that is to make technology smarter. And primarily, AI can be used to help, technology that is part of AI can be used to help enhance media and enhance media professionals' lives and jobs um, and to make users' lives easier. So that's the main opportunity we see today. We're just starting. Again, it's a field of research that we have a lot of different players that are experimenting with different tools. And here's an example of that. So um, one of the things that we're thinking about in Project Jigsaw, which is a project that uses machine learning in different ways to help protect freedom of speech online, is we're thinking about what if technology could help improve conversations online. So one threat to people's feel feeling of being able to participate in media and discussion, and discussion boards and also feel like they feel, you know, want to actually go out and find conflicting viewpoints in media is, um, is trolling and online harassment and abuse. And right now, the best options that a lot of publishers have is having an, a discussion moderator manually feed through or have keyword word flags and things like that. So one API that we've made available for everyone is called the Perspective API as part of this project. And we've released a model that actually predicts the toxic impact that a certain comment could have on a discussion. So it, um, th this is a, 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 a tool, an open tool that publishers could use um, to enhance their current journalism efforts, for example, and also encourage kind of a healthier, healthier uh, culture within our media using, um, using machine learning. Um, 
Also, the second answer in terms of how AI is, is already um, alive and impacting the media today is that there's a huge growth of conversational user interfaces that um, users are starting to use as a way to engage with online content. And this opens up opportunities to connect in a more natural and useful way. So if the idea is let's use our technology to make people's lives easier, you actually can use natural language now via conversational UI to help simplify users' lives, respond to their questions in natural language with an easier, you know, it's easier than ever before. So there are a number of tools available um, for free and in the open that you can use to, to begin experimenting with these and understand how you can fit into users' lives in a new way. Okay, so that's the uh, uh, extremely interesting, but is Google also thinking in terms of the generation of content through artificial intelligence, or is that outside your, your province? This is a, an enabler of connections rather than a, the provision of content directly. Um, I work on new developer tools yeah. across new platforms and products for Google. So um, my, special, my speciality will be understanding what tools we can provide for others to unlock the experiences they And if, if we want to access the API tool as, as, as publishers, the, uh, the first one you mentioned that, that gives us context around how comments will be received, that's openly available? We can, it is. We, we can simply go in now and access it? Yeah, you can, there's, a, there's a, an easy link if you look for Perspective API yeah. um, or Google the Jigsaw project. You'll see a, a number of tools that, that can, are made available with a few clicks. Okay, that's great. So I think if we're lucky, we can now go to Francesco's slides, I think. So let's give it a go. Thank you. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so I, I just wanted to show you four uh, very brief examples uh, to address a, an important question, which is the, the misconception that sometimes uh, we have that by using AI, uh, we don't require humans uh, to do anything. And that's, qu that's quite the opposite. Um, any automation, uh, efforts or artificial intelligence effort uh, require uh, deep uh, human and editorial expertise. Uh, the example that you are seeing here is um, a project that we are doing with a company called Automated Insights. And uh, what we do is that we pick um, structured data, so it works really well for financial news or, or sports data or government data. Um, that, which is the first step there. And then we have our journalists and our content uh, creators um, essentially develop the templates that you see in the middle. This requires a, an entirely new set of, of skills uh, in the sense that the, the template that you see in the middle um, is uh, what we call branch writing. So think of the example of uh, the first sentence is, Apple uh, posts uh, revenue of uh, X, and what we tell the system is that if X is bigger than you know two billion dollars, then the next sentence that comes after it is this specific sentence. Otherwise, it's it's some it's some other sentence. So this kind of thinking is uh, requires some more logic, and it's close. It closer it closely aligns with how programmers think rather than how journalists think. Um, and essentially what the, what the AI does is it matches the data with uh, the template and it, it's able to generate uh, a story that is readable by humans, which is, which is the, the third uh, image there. That's a real story uh, based on financial uh, information from, from Apple, for example. Okay. This is automation. This is uh, with little human intervention once you know, the templates are developed, it goes through a Q&A process and so on. Martha, I think you wanted to come in there. Oh, I, I just wanted to say that um, while content is king and this is really powerful, this is just the tip of the iceberg, really. Um, I don't know if you could have my slide or not, but I wanted to talk about something that we hear over and over again at these, con at these conferences, and that is how can we make money from this? Because this strategy, whether you just work with automated insights on, on um, optimizing your content, or if you do a other project work, it's the, the investment is big. So you want to offset that by making money. Um, so one really huge switch that you're going to have to make as publishers is you're going to need to operate like Google and Facebook, 
why. And this face, this uh, Facebook and Google chart shows the reason why. Um, as time goes on, Google and Facebook uh, basically, you know, to your credit, um, are making about 75% of all digital revenue, full stop, um, and growing. As you can see, Google, which is marked here as Alphabet, the parent company of Google, and the blue bar, which is Facebook, um, represent the vast majority of the money. But why is that? It's because, in large part, because they are driven by data and they are driven by AI. Now, I don't have a chart for what's going on in China right now, but China also is a huge presence in AI, and you ought to be watching what they are doing because they are, they are getting a lot of investment by government and other sources in order to compete with the likes of Google and others that are in the AI game. They want to win the AI game in China. So um, we're actually visiting um, all of the AI players in December. We're going to Baidu, Tencent, Alibaba, those are the, that's known as BAT, uh, the, the trifecta of AI in China, but there's so many more that are uh, startups that are basically trying to control this environment and control how we make money using AI. So why is this chart important? It's because what you, if you are not driving your data, driving your revenue through data and, through, and eventually through AI, you must start now. And one of the, one of the uh, presentations that I do is called Survival of the Fittest. And it's all the underpinning of you better get in this data game and you better get in this AI game right now. It's gonna take you some time uh, to hire people from outside and to educate some of the people who are already in your organization to think um, in a different way about how we run our organizations, um, leveraging the data that we have and leveraging this wonderful thing, AI, that is really going to advance our companies. And I sort of really want to come back to that. Sorry, Francesca. Yeah, I, I would just add a, a slightly different perspective, actually, on, on Martha's slide, which is, Although, uh, you know, the Google and Microsoft and Amazon and the big tech players are taking the lion's share of, of advertising, they're also lowering the costs uh, of entry with, you know, APIs and uh, in different cloud-based services that are enabling companies uh, like mine to quickly experiment uh, and be um, uh, exposed to, to, to AI. Of course, the revenue uh, question is, is an important one. Uh, but um, I, I think it's something to, to keep in mind. And I want to come back to your next two slides in a, in a moment, but Alice, quickly, that cooperation point is an important one. And we heard that this morning. There's a tendency sometimes to see the, the duopoly as a, as a threat, and as Martha's pointed out, it's, um, it's a great achievement to have achieved that market dominance. But we've also heard that um, the importance of, um, of partnerships, that actually one of the ways of exploiting the future of AI is to partner with companies like Google. And is that there's something you're seeing already that people are coming to you and talking to you and using your tools to actually promote and enhance their own move into AI-driven uh, media? Um, I'll address that in two ways. Yeah. The first is to discuss AI research. So it's critical that we are as open as possible with our tools by enabling libraries to be available for anybody to use. Um, we have a lot, dozens of grants for top researchers to access data sets and actually build technologies and innovation outside of Google. And I think that an open approach to research is the best way to make sure that as a society, we're make, taking responsible steps and building AI in the direction that benefits everybody. And that's something we're really invested in. And then the second thing is just as um, platforms, we definitely wanna enable enterprise tools for anyone to use, as you mentioned. Um, you no longer have to be a big company that invests in expensive infrastructure. Anyone can use a number of tools to build AI-like experiences or learn machine learning on your own um, at little cost. So this is really interesting. This is not a topic that is limited to the very largest companies who can afford enormous teams of developers because some of the groundwork is already being done by companies like Google right. who are providing those tools for pretty much anyone to use. Yeah, there's some really great stories that are um, available as I was looking up on some of the examples. One of my favorite story is of a cucumber farmer in Japan that, used, that discovered TensorFlow and um, helped his aging mother 
no longer have to manually sort cu cucumbers by training the model to build a model that can you know, sort the cucumbers automatically and help basically them uh, focus on other things to grow their business. That's brilliant. And not it's, only is it brilliant, great. it's also, I'm pretty sure it's the first time we've had a cucumber farming anecdote at FIP, which is great, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, there's another example of a, teenage, a teenager in high school that actually got his hands on TensorFlow and worked in partnership with uh, Mammogram Lab data and to actually help with mammogram detection to help solve breast cancer. And that's just an example of There are examples the of that tool. basically anyone can do it. You don't Absolutely. have to be a rocket scientist to get involved in this stuff. Exactly. Great. Francesco, can we just return to you for a moment and let's just see if we can bring you yeah, up. Yeah, and I'll piggyback on the topic yeah. of um, experimentation and collaboration, which is crucial uh, in the age of AI. And in the same uh, sort of uh, spirit of uh, this project, which focuses on, on full automation from data uh, to text, uh, here's another uh, project that we are doing with uh, Wivits, which is to automatically uh, turn uh, text into uh, video. And this works particularly well for very templatized uh, types of stories. So imagine, you know, profiles of public figures or, um, you know, highlights of, of uh, you know, financial, financial data. So, the approach here in, with video automation is very similar to uh, text automation in the sense that the journalists are still the ones who are developing the templates and making sure that the, you know, sort of the, the nesting bed exists for, uh, you know, for the content to, to be produced at scale uh, with, with, uh, human, uh, with little human intervention uh, in the long term. Beyond automation, what we are doing is uh, augmentation. And augmentation is essentially leveraging uh, different uh, technologies, uh, specifically machine learning, to extract hidden insights from data. The example that you are seeing here is a collaboration with the MIT Media Lab, uh, where we mined um, millions of tweets uh, and uh, replies to, to, the, uh, to President Trump's uh, social media postings, and by analyzing uh, how public discourse has evolved over time, we were able to identify some, some very interesting patterns. So, for example, we were able to identify pa partisan bias uh, when people are replying to tweets. And so these insights that are very difficult to, um, you know, to, 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 to understand with, you know, with the naked eye, uh, are now becoming uh, very easy to, um, uh, to analyze and, and to take that data and create a story. Makes absolute sense. That's a great example. There's so much to cover here, and sadly, we are unbelievably already running out of time. This is a huge area to talk about. Um, in a moment, I want to ask you all the legendary closing question, which is, you know, if you could give everyone one thing to take away. Look, do this now to be ready for a future that is going to involve AI. I'd love you to come back on that, your sort of 10-second piece of advice. Before we do that, um, if we have any questions uh, from the room, we'll take those. And I can see one over there. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> no pressure <laughs> with the catch. Um, thank you very much. I, I had a question on. Um, on something that's probably a little bit more linear is the data acquisition. So we've talked about the use of the data and how it's applied in AI, but uh, in Europe we're facing GDPR, uh, there's the decline of the cookie, uh, you know, the rise of persistent IDs. So how do publishers manage the acquisition of unauthenticated uh, data on users? And, and what do you think the long-term trend of that is gonna be and how it feeds into this lake of data that we're sitting with and hopefully we'll continue to sit with. Well, Martha, the lake of data was yours. Do you want yeah, to respond yes. to that? Yeah, sure. So um, more than half of our conferences are here in Europe. And of course, the, no conference would be complete in Europe without having a single sign-on presentation, at least, or, or more, or a session. So um, every publisher now needs to create a single sign-on strategy. Um, so that they can collect data about their users with permission. Um, to some degree, 
there are advantages to this anyway, that, that this pressure to, to do this, and, and you know, we can't any longer randomly collect data as we used to. Um, in, in the country where I'm from, you know, it's, it's, there, there was almost no rules. Um, we can collect whatever we want, but here in, in Europe, it's a different reality starting next year, and so therefore, um, the, the thing to do is to create the single sign-on strategy, uh, and interface um, so that you can collect data with permission and, uh, and follow the rules of the EU, basically. Okay. Um, I'll move on now. I'd love to take more questions from the floor, but unfortunately we really are um, out of time. So, Alice, uh, could I start with you? It's an impossible question, and I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, if you could give the whole room one bit of advice, go back to your business and do this to be slightly better prepared for an AI-enabled future. I think it has to do with talent resourcing. So if you feel like you can train yourself or someone on your team to be an expert to learn about what tools are available and begin experimenting, that's great. Otherwise, find people that have the expertise in something that's directly applicable to that which is difficult that may, might be enhanced by machine learning today. So I think take a really tangible, on-the-ground approach um, and invest in training and experimentation. And uh, you'll learn a lot about where the gaps are that can be, you know, lowest hanging fruit to, to be uh, facilitated by, by AI today. For Great. Your and Martha, beyond the obvious response, which is attend the right conferences, <laughs> uh, what should people do? Well, I, you know, half an hour isn't um, long enough to even scratch the surface of artificial intelligence, which is an amorphous topic. It's, it's humongous. So I would say get a grounding in what it is that artificial intelligence is. And, uh, and, and, and all the components thereof, and, and, then, um, and then start formulating a strategy if you haven't already, and, form, and, and gathering a team. Um, I'm happy to give you all the re free research that we have. We have tons of it. Some of it's recaps of our conference, and some of it is, um, is, is just full-blown research, um, because I'm, I'm really just an academic. So um, I'm happy to give it to you if you give me my card. It, it'll give you sort of the foundation of what, uh, what the possibilities are for your companies, basically. So I'm hearing research, I'm hearing hire or develop the right talent. Francesco, what's your 10 seconds? I piece would of double down on collaboration and experimentation. Uh, you'll find it surprising how cheap, sometimes free, it is to um, you know, test these new tools, collaborate with startups, with universities. And that's a really good way to get exposed to, to new thinking. Uh, and essentially uh, lower the barriers of, of, of testing these new technologies. Thank you. So can I ask you please, uh, great panel discussion, terrible we didn't have any more time, but can I ask you please to thank our panelists? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, with that, it's change over time again. Uh, we have uh, a couple of minutes to move between stages. Um, uh, if you want to stay in here, it's finding audiences through brand campaigns. Uh, How Emotion helps you win with video made for social is on the specialist stage. And uh, the FIP Insight Research Deep Dive on Live the Passion is on the Insight Theatre stage. So uh, we're starting again here in three or four minutes. <laughs>